now to the book of Zechariah, Zechariah chapter number 8, please, Zechariah chapter number 8, if you will. Uh, as, we, as we turn there, uh, I'm going to ask that you uh, bear with me. We have been um, going through the book of Zechariah, there's these lessons, these, um, this Bible study has been taking a little longer as we go through it, just because there's a lot of content and materials. Um, every, every time I get to them, I, I think to myself, this is going to be simple. And then, um, and it's not. And so, um, thankfully, chapter 8 is a little bit more simple than chapter 7. Uh, chapter 7 is giving some, um, some uh, clarity, but it's kind of a story-oriented, just to give you an update as far as what had happened on chapter number 7 from the book of Zechariah. Uh, it's important to remember context. Remember, the context is that this is post, what, post post-exilic. Good job. Post-exilic. Isn't that a, don't you just feel smarter when you say post-exilic because it is post-exile. Now, in light of the fact it's post-exilic, it is still the time of the, what do you think I'm going to say next? Gentiles. All right. So this is the time of the Gentiles. What I mean by that is uh, where the, the Gentile dominance in, in uh, Israel and Jerusalem is still taking place. And uh, which, which is interesting because Daniel addresses the time of the Gentiles. Jesus speaks of the end of the time of the Gentiles, all this leading into there, except we're seeing a portion there where Israel, uh, talking about the, the Jews from Judah, so these are the, we would call them that way because they are from Judah, they're going to be, they're back into Judah, they're specifically back in Jerusalem. Now, in that, um, they are there and they're kind of controlling things, but there's no question the time of the Gentiles is still in place. Now, there's going to be a lot of stuff going on with the temple and things like that. Um, I, I've, been, I've been thinking, I don't know how far I want to go into the intertestamental, intertestamental period. There's a lot of speculation. I don't want to get into too many things that are not known of in scriptures. Um, I believe at some point it becomes a history of things that we just don't know. And so I don't want to spend a lot of time in that. But there's a lot of interesting things that take place after Zechariah. Basically, there's one more book after Zechariah. Does anybody know what that book is? Malachi, right? The, the great Italian prophet Malachi is the, the next one. And so uh, anyways, um, that, that, that's it. That's it. And so it gives some information as far as what's going to happen between Testaments. And then to find out what's been, and there's a lot of Bible that talks about, a lot of scripture that talks about it. And I don't mean the book of Maccabees, okay? That's not Bible. But uh, I mean, there's, there's a lot of stuff that takes place during that time period. But in this, this is the intertestament, I'm sorry, this is not the intertestament. This is the post-exilic period, time after they've come back from exile. And uh, they, they are possessing it, but not under their own power. And so uh, remember, it was the, uh, the, the Medo-Persian Empire that basically, or the Persians, that sent them back. Not only did they send them back, they funded them. And they're the ones that somewhat provided protection, depending on which time period we're talking about, for what, what phase is being dealt with. And so anyways, there's a lot going on. Um, but boy, they've been through it. They've been through it. And, and uh, when we talk about what they have been through, who sent that chastisement and judgment on them? It was a God. It wasn't because they just overcame the people of God who were doing right and they overcame God. God's the one that sent them. God's the one that opened the pathways. God's the one that opened those gates and said, you come on in. And, uh, and there, then the Babylonians took over. So anyways, they've come home now. And while they're there, they have a lot of challenges. They have been promised. They've been promised something's going to take place. They're going to be building this temple and they're going to be worshiping God. And, and that the time period of captivity and specifically this is important the captivity is not just so much that they were under rule of somebody but specifically that they were not even home and so what i'm saying with that is there's a big emphasis and nothing catches there's a very big emphasis on the geographical location that's very important uh eternally there's gonna be a big emphasis on the geographical location we're speaking specifically of jerusalem chapter eight is, is spending a lot of time specifically addressing that the geographical location you're, you're going to see this word Zion. Zion. Uh, Zion is in reference to Jerusalem. It would have been one of the peaks there, or what they would call a mountain peak or a hill there in Jerusalem itself, and so it would be seen. And so this is a very important place. And so when you see that, it's talking about this location. And, uh, and, and what's happening is it's not being occupied. It's not being dominated by. It's not being the bright light. It's not a city set on a hill that can't be hit. It's just it's in, in, um, in poor management, if you can say it that way, not occupied by people that should be in charge there. And so now they're back and they're building the temple and they've built up their houses already, kind of. And they haven't built the walls yet, but they're about to. And so things are starting to get better. But boy, it's scary to do those things for God. So in chapter 7, the context was God had given them already eight visions and then um, saying, 
I'm going to do this stuff in the future, so go ahead and build it. And that was the whole point of chapter, the end of chapter 6. Just go do it. God, God's in charge. Um, he's coming back, and he's going he's gonna to rule and reign. Things are going to be great. Just build this, this temple. But in chapter 7, they asked a question, a group of, uh, a group of representatives from Bethel, which is just a few miles away from Jerusalem, says, should we still be doing this fast that we're doing? And um, this fast was a specific one. Um, and I, I can't remember, and, uh, verse number 5 of chapter 7 talks about the 5th and 7th month, although there's four fasts there. But, uh, but anyways, they mentioned two of them. Do we need to keep doing these fasts? And the fasts were they were not eating and for a day, and they would mourn. So this is weeping and crying. So do we have to keep doing this? And God said, that's not really the question. The question is, were you doing it to me in the first place? Is this something even for me? And God is saying, absolutely needs to be done for me. And that's where he rebukes them and tells them that, that pulling away where he has been trying to instruct them by previous prophets. And, uh, and these previous prophets, Miss Lily, if you'll, you'll watch this way. Thank you. I'm going to hit somebody with your hair. Um, but with, with, um, with the previous prophets, they had been warning them in regards to uh, what they were doing, that they were not being the nation they were supposed to be. And it give the, gives a description that they, they did not hearken. In other words, they heard it, but it didn't do it. And they pulled away, and then they stopped their ears. And the idea was that the progression where the more that God would warn them, the more they refused to listen. So get your hearts right. What are you saying? It's got to be about me. It can't be just for your sake and because you're going to be, you're going to be, want to, you want to be part of this mighty nation. It has to be for the glory of God. So chapter 8 is going to continue. Chapter 7 chapter 8 go together. And so chapter 8 is going to continue that. But it's going to come as kind of a part two. It's going to be the answer. It's going to explain some things. Look at verse number one. It says, again, the word of the Lord of hosts came to me saying. So Zechariah is saying, God, God sent me his word again. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I was jealous for Zion with great jealousy, and I was jealous for her with great fury. The term jealous is an interesting one because jealous isn't just, just meaning that he's uh, envious of or wants something. It's literally in the benefit of that individual. Uh, this is something that's a, it's a good thing. It, it's, it's, a, it's a good thing that God is jealous towards Zion. Now, he does mention specifically Zion, which is interesting because he doesn't mention his people. There are references that he is jealous towards his people, but in this one he expresses Zion specifically, so the geographical location. Now, in this, uh, he does talk about jealousy, basically saying, this is mine, and I want mine to be the way mine's supposed to be. Now, he, he, gives, a, um, he gives an emotional value of jealousy towards something that was inanimate, uh, Mount Zion, right? The, no, normally, we don't generally do that. When we do, we kind of mean it in kind of tug-and-cheek way. Like, I, would, I joke around frequently, I'm sure you've heard me say this, that I love cinnamon toast crunch now there's not like an emotional draw to cinnamon toast crunch where every now and then i, I light candles to it and I, I mourn the loss of the empty boxes that have gone through that's not something that's there but at the same time we understand there's a great affection here he's saying that there is affection but it's for something there's not an animus not that god just loved that beautiful mountain and and has pictures of it in heaven that's not the draw the idea here is this was representative of his glory and what's supposed to be done right here and so he's pointing to this, and so he says he's jealous. The term jealous has the idea of great zeal. Um, it's something specific, not just that he is, um, he is mindful of something that belongs to him, but he's zealously protecting that. And he says, I was jealous towards it. Uh, let me encourage you. This is not the message, but let me encourage you. Men, be jealous for your wife. For your wife. And women, you, uh, wives, you should be jealous for your husband. That's a good thing. And I hear it all the time. It's a weird thing. My husband's just so jealous. He should be. That's important. That's an okay thing. God's jealous for Israel. The Bible describes that God's jealous for his church. God's jealous for Zion. He expresses this jealousy on a number of occasions. It's okay for you to be jealous. Now, I think you could be bad about it. And uh, I think it, there's a point where like, you just don't trust anything. And we're like, oh, that guy looked at you. And, and when you glance, I can tell you guys are meeting eyes. What's going on here? Like, what are you talking about? We're driving opposite sides of the freeway. How could we be looking at each other? Well, okay, so there, there could be an emphasis where it's just insecurity. But God's not insecure. God knows what's his, and it's not the way it's supposed to be, and he's fighting for it. He, he demonstrates this through um, there's some of the other prophets and, and marriages uh, that would need to be, uh, or a marriage where the, the wife is an unfaithful wife, and he has to get her back. Anybody know which book I'm, book I'm talking about? Hosea, exactly. The book of Hosea, where he, to illustrate what's going on, is an unfaithful wife. And this is how God perceives it. I'm going to do everything I can, make it hard 
or easy or take care of or remove things. I'm going to do those things in order to win my wife back. And likewise, he's given this illustration, but specifically about Zion in this case. Um, in verse number two, it ends, and I was jealous for her with great fury. The term jealousy already has a zeal about it, but he's saying, and some. I mean, excessively so. Verse three, and I'm going to go ahead and read the rest of the chapter. You'll notice three portions primarily. The first portion is going to be about things in the future. There's going to be a middle portion that's going to specify that this is right now or the time that they're reading it. And then it's going to be, a, again, a future portion at the end of the chapter. Look at verse number three. Thus saith the Lord, I am returned unto Zion and will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. Now notice there's two things. So he's talking about the group that's there. He's saying, I am returned to Zion and I will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. And Jerusalem shall be called a city of truth and the mountain of the Lord of hosts, the holy mountain. And so this is going to specify the way it's going to break up this chapter. He is there, and this is something he's going to do in the future. Verse number four, thus saith the Lord of hosts, there shall, yet, there shall yet old men and old women dwell in the streets of Jerusalem. doesn't mean that there's going to be homeless people that are older. He's literally talking about that there's people out and about that are older, or that are old, is what he calls them in this passage. And every man with his staff in his hand for very age. In other words, for a long time or old, many, many years of age. Verse 5, and the streets of the city shall be full of boys and girls playing in the streets thereof. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, it, it, if it be marvelous in the eyes of the rem remnant of this people in these days, should it also be marvelous in mine eyes, saith the Lord of hosts. I'll be honest, I struggled with that verse for a little bit. I don't know why, because now I see him like, well, duh, this is obviously what it means. Uh, verse number, I'll tell you what that means in just a little bit. Also, this is bothering me. Did you notice this thing moved like a little edge? I hold this a lot, so sorry. There's like the little piece that holds things in place moved to the side a little bit, so it's not straight, and that's going to bother me the entire message, all right? So I cut off early, and I run off to get a hammer. That's, that's you know what happens, okay? Um, now, don't intentionally bother me with things, okay? If things are very awkward, then um, I don't know. It, it's enough to distract me. Where are we going at? Sorry. Um, verse, number, um, verse number seven. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Behold, I will save my people from the east country and from the west country. And I will bring them, and they shall dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. They shall be my people, and I will be their God in truth and in righteousness. Thus saith the Lord. Notice there's a paragraph change, verse number nine. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, let your hands be strong, ye that hear in these days, um, hear in these days these words by the mouth of the prophets, which were in the day that the foundation of the house of the Lord of hosts was laid, that the temple might be built. Now, he mentions two, he mentions prophets, plural. We know that Ezra was also a prophet during the time there in Jerusalem. Verse 10, verse 10, for before these days, there was no hire for man, nor any hire for beast. Neither was there any peace to him that went out, of, went out or came in because of the affliction. For I set all men, every one against his neighbor. But now I will not be unto the residue of this people as in the former days, saith the Lord of hosts. For the seed shall be prosperous, the vine shall give her fruit, and ground shall give her in increase, and the heavens shall give their due, and I will cause the remnant of this people to possess all these things. And it shall come to pass that as ye were a curse among the heathen, O house of Judah and house of Israel, so will I save you, and ye shall be a blessing. Fear not, but let your hands be strong." For thus saith the Lord of hosts, as I thought to punish you when your fathers provoked me to wrath, saith the Lord of hosts, and I repented not. So again have I thought in these days to do well unto Jerusalem and to the house of Judah, fear ye not. These are the things, and this is going to be the, the last portion, verse 16. These are the things that ye shall do. Speak ye every man the truth to his neighbor. Execute the judgment of truth and peace in your gates. And let none of you imagine evil in your hearts against his neighbor. And love no false oath, for all these are things that I hate, saith the Lord. And the word of the Lord of hosts came unto me, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, The fast of the fourth month, and the fast of the fifth month, and the fast of the seventh month, and the fast of the tenth, shall be to the house of Judah joy and gladness and cheerful feasts. Therefore love the truth and peace. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, It shall yet come to pass that there shall be some, there shall come people, and the inhabitants, uh, inhabitants of many cities, and the inhabitants of one city shall go to another, saying, Let us go speedily to pray before the Lord, and to seek the Lord of hosts. I will go also. 
Yea, many people and strong nations shall come to seek the Lord of hosts in Jerusalem and to pray before the Lord. Thus saith the Lord of hosts. In those days it shall come to pass that ten men shall take hold out of all languages of the nations, even shall take hold of the skirt of him that is a Jew, saying, We will go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. Let's pray. Lord, give us wisdom, Father, as we open to understand what the scriptures here mean, what you're trying to tell us, that we would be encouraged, strengthened, and, and further our knowledge of you so we can have further, further faith in you and what you're telling us, God. So we ask this now in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so we're going to break this up, and I'm going to scare you right now. We're going to, have, we're going to break this up beyond the three portions. Technically, there's a fourth, because in one little spot, it tells them, do this, do this, do this. But you have the future, present, future, the way he's going to be addressing this in this, this chapter. And it's very obvious the way he talks about it, because he says, right now, I'm going to right now, and then this is going to happen. So he's talk, he, gives you, he speaks to you in time frame, so it makes it very easy to understand the, the chapter in that way. Um, but anyways, we're going to break it down into eight more points beyond that, okay? So number one, look at the, prom, uh, look at the punishment. Look at the punishment. In verse number uh, one and two, we understand that God is speaking, and he specifies it over and over and over again. In fact, you'll see it in a lot of verses throughout this in verse number two, verse number three, four, six, seven, nine, 14, 19, 20, 23. All of them say, say it starts off with the word of the Lord of hosts. Again, the word of the Lord of hosts. Saying, God says this, making it very, very clear, I want you to know this. Now, ultimately, he could have started this at the beginning. Hey, I've got a laundry list of, you, of things to do. But what do you think he's trying to stress to us if he says over and over again that this is the, the word of the Lord of hosts? What, what, do you, what do you think that means? Pay attention. This is important. And not, not only that, he's, you, this is so that there's no question where it's from. This is not something that, well, we're going to draw some conclusion or maybe Zechariah came up with some stuff. He's saying very clearly, this is from God, and there are more statements. He's saying this is what it is. There's not a lot of fine details and big dialogue. It's just statement items that are going to be mentioned. If you break down through all the ways that it's mentioned in here, you're going to find that he's addressing different topics each time he's addressing them. The first one is going to be in verse number two, which is the punishment. He says, thus saith the Lord of hosts, which is interesting, he says it this way, because the Lord of hosts oftentimes has a military value to it. The word hosts would be kind of like armies, the great hosts, the great number of, of, of people or, or angels. And so this is the Lord of hosts. And so you would find in several passages where there would be the captain of the Lord of hosts, you know, the, the great, cap, great captain or general. This is the guy that's in charge. And more importantly, this is the God who is in charge. Now, in this, the Lord of hosts is saying something that he was jealous for, for Zion with great jealousy and was jealous for her with great fury. Now, in this, what he's demonstrating here is that there was a lot of problems that were taking place there in Zion. Zion should have been another way. Unfortunately, instead of serving God, they were serving everybody else. We find this on multiple occasions where um, you would start really in first, well, you go back to Judges, and what's taking place there in Israel as far as a nation is that they're frequently going back to other gods. But then finally, by the time you get to Ezekiel, they have not only gone to other gods, they were hanging paintings and murals and, and idols right there in the temple. Now, you have to remember the purpose of the temple was God dwelling with man. Now, in order to do so, there was a lot of incomplete sacrifices that would be done pointing to the final sacrifice that Jesus Christ would make. But God's presence, as far as what he's telling us in the scriptures, is that he dwelled with them. He dwelled with them in the Holy of Holies, there on top, above uh, the Ark of the Covenant, between the cherubims. And, uh, and this was a very special thing for them. But finally, we find in the book of Ezekiel that they were worshiping these other gods. Um, chapters 9 through 11 address the worship specifically of Baal. And the Bible would describe it as Ichabod, God departed. And from there, that God's presence departed from, from Israel. And so they had a temple to God without the presence of God himself, which made it just like a temple for anybody else, for any other God. One which they were praying and really not getting much done simply because it was simply ritual. And uh, anyways, that being said, he addresses that aspect where Zion was not the city it was supposed to have been. He's saying, this is mine and it should have been a certain way. And so because of this, I had to execute my jealousy with great fury. Now, the point on that is that he doesn't do this against, which is why I mentioned about the difference between the geographical location and the people, is because he's going to execute his jealousy against the people, which he's going to describe in this chapter as his people, 
because of Zion the way Zion's supposed to be. And so that's why they have to be cast out. That's why they have to be sent away. And so, um, so anyways, he addresses them in this passage saying that this is what's going to take place. Now in verse 3, he goes on with a little more detail. Thus saith the Lord, I am returned unto Zion. What is this telling us? That according to verse number 2, that he wasn't in verse number 2 because he is in verse number 3 having returned because he wasn't in verse number 2. In other words, when things weren't the way they were supposed to be on Mount Zion, God sent them away. God sent them away, the, the, the people. And then in verse 3, he says them back. And so there was an aspect where they lost something. What did they lose? They lost God's presence there with them. That's what they lost, and that is a terrible loss to have. Now, uh, the Bible describes the things that, that, um, that he, were, were, are going to take place. I am going to mention that in verse number 3, he does lay out that there are two things happening. One is that he is presently returned there to, um, to in verse number 3, to return to Zion, which is interesting because what has not been finished yet? The temple. So here's a big point. The temple was not the only place God resided in. Now, ceremonially and nationally, yes. But once the people came back with a heart renewed to God, it's as if they had invited. Look at Revelation 3, for instance, when, when, uh, when the church in Laodicea is doing all those works and they've got everything right, except God says that, uh, that Jesus is outside. He's knocking to come in. Oftentimes we use that as a soul winning verse that Jesus wants you to trust him, to open your door to, to your heart and get saved. But that's not what the verse is. The verse is for Christians. Church, let Jesus back into what you're doing. Likewise, for them, they had kicked God out. And what he's explaining to them here is that now he's there. He's there even though the temple hasn't been built. Um, with this, he's addressing that uh, very clearly. Matthew chapter 23, um, we, we see a little bit building up as far as what this meant. God having dwelt with them, uh, the glory of God departed. And uh, anyways, when, when Jesus Christ came, the Bible describes it that the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his, what's the next word? Glory. glory. So the glory had come back. Now, that's good, except for what did they do when the glory came back? They said, no, we don't want it. And so with Matthew 23, Jesus speaking to groups of very religious people that were speaking of a coming Messiah, he says to them, to these people looking for a Messiah, Messiah as Messiah says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen together, gathered her ch chickens under her wings, and ye would not. Behold, and by the way, this is right before his betrayal, I mean, leading right into it. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. The house you're living in is desolate. Uh, in some ways, you can point to the temple. They have this temple, and they're doing these things. It says, an empty temple. It says, Behold, your house is left unto you desolate, for I say unto you, ye shall not see me henceforth, till ye shall say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. And Jesus is saying, I'm standing right here in front of you. Part of that, and you look at Matthew 23 and some more more detail he addresses the fact like i'm standing right here before you right now here's your chance here's your chance and they say no it's all right you're not gonna see me again you will not enjoy the glory you will not enjoy the glory of god here in jerusalem until they say something specifically blessed is he that cometh in the name of the lord in other words jesus until you recognize it's me not pastor leo but jesus until you recognize it's me he's not coming back and so uh ultimately this will be one day turned into a place a a mountain a city of truth although jerusalem in the scripture has been called many things it's been called a harlot it's been called egypt it's been called sodom but when jesus is there it'll be known as a city of truth and you find this in verse number three i am uh, thus saith the lord i am returned unto zion will dwell in the midst of jerusalem and jerusalem shall be called a city of truth and the mountain of the lord of hosts the holy mountain number two we have this peace we have not just the um, number one the punishment we also have the peace in verse four thus saith the lord of hosts there shall yet old men and old women dwell in the streets of jerusalem every man uh, with his staff in his hand for very age verse five is going to talk about the boys and girls playing in the streets it's going to give two groups of people here uh, you're gonna have old people and saying this, the city's gonna be full of them all right jerusalem's gonna have a bunch of them think about context so zechariah is speaking to a group of people that have traveled all the way from babylon and they've been there in jerusalem for some years from probably 16 years or so maybe a little further some people say mid-20s 
And so anyways, uh, when you think about traveling, I don't know how often you've traveled, but imagine having to take a 700-mile trip. How many of you would say that's pretty exhausting to travel 700 miles? All right, now let's take it back a little bit. How many of you think it's impossible if you're doing it on foot? All right, 700 miles. So imagine then if people are in Babylon and say, all right, time of captivity is over. And you've been waiting for that promise, and you're now 100 years old. And they're like, all right, now we're just going to have to march all the way back to Jerusalem, 700 miles. Or maybe it's less than that. I can't remember. I'm just making up numbers here. It might only be like 400, 500 miles. So that would be easier, right? Uh, either way, it's a long ways. And by the way, it's not like they're going to be traveling through like lush areas. We're talking about traveling through the wilderness to get there. And there's marauders and people that are like just picking on people. It's very dangerous. And we're going to go without armed guards or not too many of them. And we're going to travel with a lot of money that's going to be exposed so people can see it as, they're, as we're traveling through there. I'm going to guess that some older people didn't go. Now, we know some old people did go because the Bible talks about that in the book of Ezra. People were excited. They were building the temple. Woo-hoo! They're, 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 they're crying out in joy, also in tears because of the temple. And so anyways, th- th- we know some do go, but imagine, if you will, and this is partly speculation, it's mostly younger people that have made this trip. And uh, the, the great number, the millions of Jews that lived there are now reduced to about 50,000 people. So ultimately, this is not a lot of people. And he's saying that one day, Jerusalem, in the way that I want it to be, is going to be full of old people. There's going to be a bunch of them, which points to something. What's going to point to the fact that there's health involved in there. You don't get old by being unhealthy. Uh, that you're going to be old, and there's going to be people there. Even with the staff, they're going to age there. And, and you're going to get to very high years. It's not like people in their 40s and 50s that look old. We're talking about people that are much older, and, uh, and they're going to get to very age. In other words, big numbers. And so I don't know what the big numbers would be. But they're going to be a lot. In fact, uh, it's going to be very big numbers. And then on the other side, he's going to talk about the children. There are going to be children playing in the streets. Now, what it means by that is the fact that there's going to be kids there, and they're going to be everywhere. It's going to be a great place for them to go. Now, let's be honest. My kids don't play in the street. There's a reason why we have a fenced-in backyard. And we live in a nice neighborhood. It's not like, well, like, oh, you never know. Just typically, it's a lot of bad drug running everywhere. I mean, there is. But we generally don't worry that as, that much, except for the fact that, there's a lot of bad stuff. Uh, I remember now in my childhood, the only difference between now my childhood and, and my kids' childhood is um, the availability of knowing all those bad stories. <laughs> all right, so now we know everything that goes bad. Seemingly, we feel like it, um, but I don't trust anything. You know, and we're we're scared for a lot of those things. And raising our children, could you imagine? It's like, yeah, go ahead and play in the streets. The idea is it's safe. There's a lot of kids there and boys and girls running around, and there's no issues with what's going on. In other words, it's gonna be a great place for kids to be. Uh, that's not the case where they're at. They're scared. They're there in their Jerusalem, and they have people that don't want them there. The Samaritans don't want them there. There's people that are up against them, and a lot of dangerous things going on. So there's health and abundance going on because there's peace. Uh, verse number 6, we're going to get to the, the, the power or the, the great difficulty. Verse 6 says, uh, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, If it be marvelous in the eyes of the remnant of this people, in these days, should it also be marvelous in mine eyes. The term marvelous, we, we think of, wow, wow, okay? That's a good term. Um, other places in the scriptures, you'll see that term marvelous described as very difficult. The idea is like, this is unbelievable, like it's impossible. Yeah, and, and so what he's saying is, all right, there's going to be a great place of peace and prosperity, and, and there's going to be great things there, and, and um, it's going to be wonderful. It's going to be wonderful. I mean, old people, young people, and kids are just running around, three-year-olds are just running amok there in the streets, and everything's going fine, nobody's getting in trouble, everything's going great, safe, it's wonderful. And uh, people are like, this place? <laughs> You're talking about Jerusalem? And they're seeing people, there's drunks laid out in the street, and people are worshiping other gods, and, and there's only a handful of people there, and there's people out picketing outside of where they're standing and listening to this letter being read, and oh, I don't know if this is the place that you're talking about. So, oh yeah, and you think this is marvelous, in other words, you think it's too difficult, you think this is impossible, you, you think because you think it's impossible that I should think it's impossible. Because you think it's marvelous, you think I think it's marvelous, you think it's too difficult, so you think I'm going to think it's too difficult. And what God is saying, it's not too hard for me. Nothing shall be impossible with me is the concept here. Deuteronomy 4, uh, actually that's not the right passage, Jeremiah 32 verse 27, is there anything too hard for me, too difficult? This is the same term that's used here is marvelous, and God is saying I can do it according to my power. How will this happen? By God's power. And they're not seeing that, it's not there at that point, but he's saying he'll do it. 
further that we think of the population in verse number seven. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, behold, I will save my people from the east country and from the west country. And I will bring them and they shall dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. And they shall be my people and I will be their God in truth and in righteousness. Now, this gets a little choppy. I've looked a lot into this to try to figure out what he's talking about in this. Um, I was pretty sure I, I thought what I... what. Basically, my final conclusion was the same as it was before. But one thing I saw a lot was that um, it was basically saying, well, this has already occurred because they're standing there. So I had some people say, this was occurred when they came back from Babylon. Here's the problem. This is the people he's talking to that are in Babylon, so, uh, that came from Babylon. So if they came from there, then, he's, then obviously it hasn't happened yet it's to speak future. Some people are saying that this is literally when people from Babylon will come in, this is the people that he's addressing that will return from the east country and the west country. Not possible. Why? Because they're already there. So... Now, we might say, well, there's future migrations that will come. Well, future migrations have come. That's where we're at, actually back in Chapter 6. And so there, there have been, this is kind of the culmination of it. There's a possibility there's one more, about 50,000, that will come. But here's the other problem, is that Babylon is, uh, you may remember this from Chapter number 6, when you have the four chariots and the four horse colors that come in, and um, it describes where they went, and that some went north and some went south. Because if we remember kind of what I talked about, the north, you have invasions coming in from the north and invasions coming from the south. But an eastward invasion and a westward invasion are pretty much impossible. Uh, there's not been in their history western invasions because what's to the west there in Jerusalem or Israel? The Mediterranean Sea, what's to the east of them? Mountains, a whole bunch of mountains, very, very difficult mountains. And so you're not running camels or footmen or tanks through there. It's just impossible. It's to north and south only. And yet he says we're going to gather them from the east country and the west country. What's he saying here? From everywhere. This would be a similar terminology that you'd find uh, pretty much anywhere when he's talking about gathering them from all over the world. This is going to be from everywhere. Now, ultimately, uh, I heard one person say that it couldn't be north and south, north country, south country, because eventually you can go so far north, you're going south again. But you'll never go so far west where you're going east, and you'll never go so far east where you're going west. And so I thought that was neat. I don't know that's necessarily going to hold a lot of doctrinal weight, but it seemed to carry a lot of, lot of information there. And so anyways, the other part is that Babylon is not east or west. It's, it's um, I'm sorry, yeah, it's not east or west or both necessarily. It's northeast. And so it's, you can say east, but it's really north. It's always referred to as north. And so um, technically it's east, but it's really, really far north and then really far east. So it's not, so it's always referred to as north because that's where they come from. This would be the one occasion that they're saying Babylon is east. And so anyways, the point is, this has to be what then? It has to be future. This is what he's addressing here. And so anyways, bring them back from everything, and for them this would be exciting because the Bible describes that they've kind of pretty much gone everywhere. It's gone all over the place. Yes, Babylon has a great deal to do with it, but not, to, not only that, you have people that were, that were scattered from the northern tribes as well, as well as some of the stuffs from the southern tribes. And so there's a lot going on there. He's saying, I'm going to bring them back. Now, verse number 9, we're going to look at the prosperity. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Let me look this, explain again in verse number 8 a little bit more. And I will bring them, and they shall dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. So this is going to be future. They will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. Now, this is problematic because the people that come, they don't dwell according to this description. They shall be my people, and I will be their God in truth and in righteousness. What he's expressing there is something that's not a reality for them at that moment. They are of a minority that want to do what they're supposed to do. And he's saying, I'm going to bring my people that will be my people. Now, notice what it says there. He calls them, um, in verse number 7, I will save my people from the east country and from the west country. And at the end of verse 8, and I will be their God in truth and in righteousness. Right before that, and they shall be my people. And so, my people I'll gather, and they shall be my people. This is what he addresses in these verses. Now, this is what he's bringing in. And so, what you have here is a regathering of the delivered ones. Um, from a few other passages, you're going to see what this going to entail. Um, you're going to see, and we'll, we'll, I'm debating whether or not I'm not going to finish the chapter because we're not even close. So, but anyways, there, there are a few references in regards to what this group is going to entail. Part of it, he addresses the fact that it's my people, the same reference here. But he's also addressing a lot in chapter number 6 as far as the people that are pretty much from everywhere in verse number, um, in, ch in chapter number 6 and verse number 15, you see where they're coming in from all over the place, people from far countries that are not part of them. Um, so this is bringing them in. This is the delivery, uh, of the, the saving, the rescuing of the delivered people is what you'll find here in this one. So the population is going to be made up of something that God provides. Um, Isaiah 43 verse 5 is a great reference point. Fear not, for I am with thee. I will bring thy seed from the east and gather thee from the west. 
I will say to the north, give up, and the south, keep not back. Bring my sons from far and my daughters from the ends of the earth. In other words, back from everywhere. Now, that seems like an impossible task, but God says he's going to do it. It's going to be in prosperity, verse number 9. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, uh, let your hands be strong. And this is in the present, by the way. Here's what he's telling them. Uh, verse number 9 is going to be like, okay, so now presently, pick up your work tools. Let your hands be strong. How do we know that? Because he's going to say to them, uh, let your hands be strong, ye that hear in these days. In other words, when Zechariah was written, um, these, let me go back here. Let your hands be strong, ye that hear in these days, these words by the mouth of the prophets, which were in the day that the foundation of the house of the Lord of hosts was laid, that the temple might be built. Once again, he's going back to when the foundation was laid. He saw this book back in the book of Ezra. And he's saying, right now, you saw, the, you saw this foundation laid, and you gave up. I'm going to do this stuff. I'm going to make Jerusalem great. I'm going to do all this stuff. So here's what you need to do. Make your hands strong. Why? Because you feel like I'm tired. You, have you ever tried to work when you're completely not motivated to do it? I'm sure nobody gets like that. It's probably just me. Uh, but there's some times where I'm just like, I, I just don't feel like doing it. I just feel terrible. And then he's saying, get up. Why? I'm doing this. I'm going to do it. And so he's saying presently, go ahead and build it. You've laid the foundation. Go ahead and put the temple there. Um, in verse number 10, he points out, like, look, yeah, I get it. You're in a time period where the economy is really bad. There's no jobs. There's no hire for people or for animals. Um, the idea of animals would also be the aspect of, like, farming tools. And so there's, like, no food. There's not enough money to pay them. Things are going pretty bad. Um, but it's going gonna, it's gonna to get better. In verse number 11, I think we can finish this. Um, in verse number, uh, over verse number 10, talking about them, they're all fighting against each other. God allowed it. Verse number 11, but now I will not be unto the residue of this people as in the former days, saith the Lord. So he's saying, all right, if you don't believe me presently, here's how you can take courage on this one. I am not going to be to your group of people that are there in Jerusalem at this moment saying, I'm not going to be to you guys like I was to them back then. Now, when's the back then? Pre-exile. Uh, verse, number, verse number 12, for the seed shall be prosperous, the vine and the vine... The vine shall give her fruit, and the ground shall give her increase, and the heavens shall give their due, and I will cause the remnant of this people to possess all things. Um, verse number 13, And it shall come to pass that as ye were a curse among the heathen, O house of Judah and house of Israel, so will I save you, and ye shall be a blessing, for fear not, but let her hands be strong. And so what he explains in this passage of Scripture, this is a promise that he makes. What he's explaining to them here. Uh, I apologize. Verse 14 is super important. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, as I thought to punish you when your fathers provoked me to wrath, saith the Lord of hosts, and I repented not. So again, have I thought in these days to do well into Jerusalem and to the house of Judah. Here's what he's saying. Say, look, I'm promising you all these things. You're wanting to give up because things don't seem to be getting better. Trust me. How can you trust me? How do you know this? Because I'm not going to treat you the same way I treated the people right before the exile. How do we know this? Because according to verse 14 and 15, he says in verse 14, I got a thought in my mind, is what God says. And when they were doing wickedly, I made a decision. I was going to judge them. And I repented not. In other words, I didn't change my mind. doesn't mean that he, uh, he was doing something sinful and decided not to do something sinful. The term repentance has the idea of mindset of what we're doing. He said, I did not change my mind because I said I was going to do it and this is what needed to happen. So I did it. Likewise, I'm promising you blessings. And based on how resolute I was to send you judgment, I'm going to send you a blessing. And you can take that confidence to the bank. So pick up those tools and start building the temple. It ends with one last portion. Uh, by the way, um, don't just build it, but verses number uh, 16 through uh, and 16 and 17 tells us some things to do, very similar to chapter number 7. So I won't go through that again, but basically the way in which they're treating each other and other people. Verse number 18 through verse 23 gives a future um, promise again, if you will. Uh, look at this one, uh, verse, number, verse, number nine, verse number 18. And the word of the Lord of hosts came unto me, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, The fast of the fourth month, and the fast of the fifth, and the fast of the seventh, and the fast of the tenth, shall be to the house of Judah joy and gladness and cheerful feast. Therefore, love the truth and peace." When they talked about it, so the, the group came up from Bethel back in chapter number uh, 7. When they came up and they said that uh, we're doing these fasts and they brought lots of sorrow, does anybody remember which fast they referenced, which, which, uh, which months of the year? 5 and 7. But you notice in this one he mentions 4, 5, 7, and 10. So there's four of them that are mentioned. Now, 
scripturally, we understand why they gave us, why we have those. Um, what you have is a few, and I'll give you a quick history. On the 10th month of the ninth year of King Zedekiah, King Nebuchadnezzar invades. On, so in the ninth, ninth year. He lays siege on Jerusalem for 16 months, and on the fourth month of the 11th year. So you have the, remember, the 10th month, siege starts. Fourth month of the 11th year, so a year and a half later, uh, you have where he finally gets through into Jerusalem. Zedekiah tries to escape in the middle of the night. He escapes with his five kids. Unfortunately, he's caught. His five sons are put to death right in front of him, and then they pull out Zedekiah's eyes or the poke out his eyes um, right in front of him. The last thing he saw is for his five kids killed. Um, he was taken then to Babylon. And then in the uh, fifth month, uh, so one month after that, Neb Captain of Nebuchadnezzar returns, and they come in and basically another siege where they steal a bunch of stuff, the, the treasuries, they empty out the stuff that's there in the temple, uh, they burn down the city, they take more people captive, and so it's pretty brutal. And then uh, in the seventh month, you have Gedaliah, which you see a lot of in, in uh, Jeremiah chapter 41, where Gedaliah is the new governor that Nebuchadnezzar puts there. And Gedaliah is like everybody's best friend. He's like, all right, hey, don't worry about it. I know we're really mean to you, but I'm here to let you know that as long as you do what we say, we're going to have a great time. It's going to be a big party. Well, anyways, he really liked to party so much, he invited a few people, some assassins, one guy named Ishmael, and a few others, and they killed him. And, uh, and by the way, they were not Jews. And, and um, so Ishmael and their group convinced a few other people, and they keep just killing a bunch of people. And what could have been good ends up resulting in a big wipeout. And so it wasn't just the Babylonians. It was others around there that were just causing a lot of hatred and disgust. And, and so anyways, it takes place. So what you, what you have is the 10th month, the fourth, or the, the 10th month, and then the 4th month, and the 5th month, and the 7th month. And so each one of those days they set up as something to remember. Boy, it was brutal. We went through a lot. Let this be the reminder we need God. And so what he says in this passage of Scripture is that while in chapter 7, those were days of mourning and fasting, you're not, you're not eating and you're weeping and sorrowing. Here's what he says in his answer to chapter number 7, which he never really answered in chapter 7. Here's the answer in chapter number 8. Um, he says, in, and I lost where it says, in verse number 19, we already read it, but at the second half, it says, shall beat the house of Judah joy and gladness and cheerful feasts, therefore love the truth and peace. Here's what he's saying. While it was bad before, those months will be the months where you're going to celebrate, basically new feasts. Now, here's one thing that we were pretty sure of what we know in history is that this never became a feast day. These never became holidays. In fact, to this day, there are um, Jewish groups that actually still do the morning of the fifth month. They still do that, and the, the fasting and the mourning and the weeping, they still do that like, as a tradition because it's a feast that some groups hung on to. But he says, when it comes to what I'm doing, there's going to be a day when those months will be days of great feasting. So it's going to go from fasting to feasting. I think it's pretty cool. Um, but beyond that, he's going to explain that you should then, because of this at the very end, um, you have this gladness and cheerful feast. Therefore, love the truth and peace. The context here is this. Go do what you're supposed to with gladness that one day this will be great. This will be wonderful what's going to happen. And uh, so you have this praise. God's going to do wonderful things. In verse 20, thus saith the Lord of hosts, it shall yet come to pass that there shall, be, there shall come people and the inhabitants of many cities and the inhabitants of one city shall go to another saying, let us go speedily to pray before the Lord and seek the Lord of hosts. I will go also. And what you find there, and again, verse number 22 and verse 23 points out where people eventually are going to come and they're going to they're want to see what's going on in Jerusalem because it's so great. And so many people are going to come that there will be a Jew there and they're going to grab on some. Ten people will grab on to say, I want to go with you and to see what God is doing. Now, in verse 23, the question is, when is this? Is it, is it because they're taking their annual pilgrimage there? Or is it because, as he has referenced earlier, that he's going to bring them from the east and the west, that whatever God is doing in Jerusalem, when he gathers them back in, that he's going to want people to come with them? Now, there's a couple elements to do with this chapter that are important that I think are for the sake of study. One is the fact that he it demonstrates to them that in this, it is, in this occasion, chapter number 8, he's referencing a residue, a remnant. In fact, he mentions remnant first, and he mentions residue next. If you know anything about a residue, usually a residue is there because there was something and then now there's only a little bit left. Yeah, you catch that, right? 
In fact, you have other occasions in which people will disobey and God leaves a remnant, a residue. You have all the way back in Moses' time where God leaves a remnant, a residue. And it's always small. It's always a small group. And what he points out to them here, and this is something we'll see. We saw this back in the book of Luke with John the Baptist this past week where everybody's like, I want this. I want the Messiah. I want the great power. He's like, "Uh -uh. you need the Messiah. You need the Messiah. This is how it's going to work. And ultimately, what we find with this is that this is saying something, well, you don't just get there because, well, you're part of this family. What he's pointing out here, this is a remnant, a residue. Millions of people used to have it here. Now you've got 50,000 people. Now, 50,000 sounds like a lot. But, you know, 50,000 compared to a million, that's not a lot. So take it all Indianapolis, then you reduce it down to the township that we're in, 38th down to, I think, um, 16th, I think, but blocked off here, maybe not even that far. That, that would be about 100,000 people. So, And then you have all of Indianapolis. That's a lot of people left over, isn't it? And so you have a, a big chunk. This isn't like straight across at all Indianapolis. So you have thousands, tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, millions of people that won't be a part of this because it's important to know that what he tells them, it's not going to be until they call out on the name of the Lord. It's got to be Jesus Christ. And so the residue is simply this, those that call on Jesus. That's what he explains. We find this from the, Old, the New Testament, what he's going to explain it in this, and it has basically to do with those that are saved. This is the simplicity of it. Um, there's a lot of speculation that this is all something that's been completed. Um, you look at a few occasions, and the most common one that I found, um, which, if you know me, I don't go to a lot of commentaries, but I was curious. Okay, So uh, when it came to this um, verse number 22, verse 23, I heard a lot of this saying that basically it's taken a place either in a couple of occasions. One, that it took place after this when the temple was built. They finished the temple, and people showed up there kind of like... Um, Solomon's Temple 2.0, except for it was not as great, but people came to see what was going on. Uh, the problem with that is that you would have to remove verse 22 and verse 23 from the rest of the chapter and say, well, this is just a unique thing. People just wanted to see the wealth of it. Can't be the case because there's too much content that just never has happened. The other one would be at, um, at after Herod's Temple when um, Jesus Christ has come and um, he's, people are getting saved after Pentecost where thousands of, and by the way it would have been amazing they're in jerusalem by the way it takes place there and you have 120 people that are that are up in a, in a room and people come by thousands so about three thousand people getting saved in a day and other occasions more thousands probably about ten thousand people within the first month sounds great here's the problem in this it describes that they're wanting to travel to jerusalem so it cannot be that occasion because verse number 22 verse 23 in contrast to the book of acts um Traveling to versus being in two very different things. Um, the other part has to do with the fact, and this is an important deal when it comes to this. I, I make a reference to the residue and to the remnant because this, simply because they're part of Israel doesn't mean, well, automatically you're included in this thing. What he's expressing to them here is still specifically this. I'm going to provide something great. Just trust me. But what he's going to disclose in the plan, and we've actually seen it in multiple occasions throughout Zechariah, is all dependent on the Messiah. It's not just going to be like, oh, well, you're born this way, you're, you're a Jewish person, then you get to enter in. John the Baptist tells him the same thing, that he, would, he can chop that down and make the rocks worship him. He can take care of that. So what he's providing here in this occasion is specifically he's going to do something great, focus on Israel, Zion, and it's going to be where they're going to be coming in. He's going to be bringing them in from east and west, which is the terminology we'll find in the New Testament. Jesus uses the same terminology, and he's going to bring them in, and people are going to be like, oh, we want to know what's going on there. It's going to be wonderful. And so what he's referring to is the millennium. This is what he's talking about as far as what's going to be taking place. And he's saying, I'm going to do it. It's going to be great. And here's the good news. We're going to be there. We're there. We're brought right in. And so it's going to be wonderful. People are going to want to come with, with well, we won't be there because it's going to be at the very end of the tribulation, that, the whole time period that he addresses there. Um, but regardless, um, what we do find here is that, uh, that what God's going to do there is that a lot of people are going to want to see it. A lot of people are going to want to see it. Um, and so I think it's pretty great. Anyways, we'll, we'll be done with that um, random random point of application. Pick up the tools. Time to start working. Why? He's going to do it. He's going to do it for them. Build a temple for us. It's, we do the work. We build the kingdom of God. He uses us to do it. So let's go do that. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for the time you've given. We ask your blessing now on, um, on our lives as we apply what you've taught us, Father. Thank you for giving us a chapter like this. Lord, I know that there's much, there's very much to do here. In, uh, in the study of the book of Zechariah, much to learn. Lord, I'm praying for all of us that we would apply it. God, you're doing something great. And I know a lot of this is something that we're looking forward to. Uh, Lord, I know that we can be in gladness because of what you're going to do. Lord, I thank you for using us. Lord, we can show people what, what you're doing. Lord, you're bringing people to you. 
people. I believe you're using people here in Charity Baptist and other churches around our country and around the world to tell them of you, that you're coming again. Lord, I pray that we would take great joy in that and pick up the tools to work. We ask this in Jesus' name.